When I told George that I wanted to talk about data, I think I gave him a heart attack. Because, um, you know, I'm the guy that talks about wisdom, right? So he probably was thinking, well, you know, what's Kiko going to do? Is he, and actually, in my TEDx talk, what I say is wisdom is the rooftop with the beautiful views, and data is the basement. So probably you were thinking, you know, probably a wrong talk for Kiko. Um, and, and I'm on the record saying that um, even though everybody is concerned about the skills gap, I am very concerned about the wisdom gap. And you'll see in a few minutes how, what I mean by that. It's obvious that all leaders worldwide, and all of you, are exposed to a very confusing times. And there isn't a day that goes by where we don't hear about the next crisis. Um, but if you look at our days, and I love this painting. I use it in all my talks. Um, and I don't have the rights for it, by the way. Um, you know, and I like it because, not because it's beautiful, because it's beautifully unpleasant. It's disturbing. And this is my day, and this is your day. And it's always interesting how people react to complexity. You know, as humans, we try to simplify it instead of just thinking that this is it. Complexity cannot be reduced. And the title of the painting is Irreducible Complexity. And if you are looking for simple simplicity, that is different. That is higher understanding. And a colleague of mine that is also doing wisdom research said it beautifully. Uh, he said, wisdom enables the interpreter to see more complexity. So if you were able to see the patterns in a complex world, then you will feel at ease. And that's what wisdom brings. So my framework, which I'm going to show you in a minute, basically says wisdom is our GPS for complexity. And we're all born with it. We just have to nurture the senses. So after the research, I came up with eight senses or eight dimensions out of the many that wisdom has. Um, I love them all. But when it comes down to data, probably there are two that come to mind. The rational sense, your cognitive sense, evidence-based decision making, and the practical sense. Now, when I talk about these things, uh, people ask me, so, what do you mean by the aesthetic sense? Is that like the physical beauty? And I say, no, no, no. What I mean is beautiful outcomes. So when I talk to educators about this, it's very clear to them what a beautiful outcome means versus an ugly outcome. And you can detect that very quickly. Learning and equity, those are beautiful outcomes. Another sense, and this is the most surprising one. I call it timeless. And you know, being a Spaniard, I can invent words in English. Um, <laughs> It's the perspective of time, and we are losing it sometimes. Um, the ability to put in perspective past, present, and future. And it's very important. And of all the wise people, quote unquote, that I research, this is the strongest of the dimensions. It's not knowledge. It's not experience. It's the ability to put things in perspective in time. So let me just do a little bit of that. The, my employer, Lumina Foundation, a few years ago, set this goal, 2025. And when I was hired by Lumina, you know, being European, not having enough information or experience about higher ed in the US, during the hiring process, they said, so why do you want this job? So I said, well, 2025. Okay, let me, let me think. 2025 means something to me and my family. So, you know, back to now, this is my family. Um, I have little ones. We're late parents, we love it. Um, now, those little ones will be in college age by 2025, which I think saved the interview and I got the job because it was very obvious that I had something at stake in this, in this thing. Um, now, our evaluation department always says, hey, we have one more year to figure this out because the data will not come until 2026. Now, 2026 is also an interesting year for me because a hundred years back, my dad was born in 1926. So I start to make connections that way. And I'm going to take you through a little bit of a timeline to give you a little bit of perspective of who I am and where I come from. 1936, my dad was 10. And there was a Spanish Civil War. I you saw the happiness and the smiles in my kids. This is what they were living in 1936. So a lot of these kids 
because of the situation, were basically sent to other countries. And my dad was one of those. So when he was nine or 10, he just boarded one of his trains and went to Belgium. Now, I cannot imagine myself or my wife going through this situation right now. He's saying goodbye to my kids in a train like this and going to another country to find other parents and hoping that they will go back. He came back. Uh, he was, he, when he was talking to me about these things, he was sad that he had to actually say goodbye to his Belgian parents. But obviously, he came back safely. And hopefully, as you can see here, uh, the rest went well. Now, in 1966, I was born. So you know, go back to the 60s years. And in 1976, in conversations with my dad, he reminded me that he saw the first ATM. And I'm going to make you a little bit of a trip through technology, because data has a little bit to do with that. Funny that my first bachelor's degree is in IT. And I had a lot of conversations with my dad about technology and how he not really appreciated it after all he went through. But at any rate, 1986, that was my college years. And then I was exposed to this thing. Actually, that's how I learned computers, with that thing. 2001, my dad passed, and the iPod was launched, right? So how amazing it is that my dad didn't even see this stuff. Now, I remarry in 2007 with my wife, Susanna. The iPhone comes out. And as you probably remember, since the iPhone launched, everything has changed, everything. The internet is in our hands now, and a lot of things are happening that we couldn't even imagine. Now, I got that thing for my uh, wedding gift, which was interesting. Um, in 2008, my first is born in Boston. 2010, the first iPad comes out. Um, in 2011, my second one is born. And now, you know, it's, it's all over the place, right? So now, now, I have to, now I have to pay for, you know, the, the, uh, the price of technology is very, very clear. Now, um, funny enough, in 2015, Alexa comes in. And I don't know whether you have ever heard of that. But it's this little piece of technology that Amazon puts out there, very similar to Siri. But you put it somewhere in the middle of your living room, and you ask questions, and you address Alexa. So I put it there, I just play, and say, hey, Alexa, how's the weather today? And you know, has a great voice recognition, tells me the story about the weather of today. My kids' first reaction is, where is Alexa? <laughs> like, is, is it inside? But immediately, they got how to do this. And I will never forget this. I, I'm sure I will remember this for years to come. The first question they ask, Alexa, can you make breakfast and clean my bed? <laughs> it's like, oh, Jeff Bezos, you have work to do, my friend. Because I don't think these generations really understand, you know, it's weather information enough. Um, now, the real story here is that you look at the curve of progression. And it would be a pity if we don't take advantage of technology. So I'm a big believer that in this progress, and knowing that my dad lived years where the curve was not that steep. Um, there has to be data out there that we can use for good. Now, back to Goal 2025, and this is what the foundation talks about all the time. <laughs> you know, part of the reform we need to achieve is higher education. And many people say, well, that's very oxymoronic, changing higher ed. Now, if you look at the picture, it's quite telling uh, that we live in, a, in an era of technology and change, and we are in the business of changing higher ed. So good luck with that. Um, now, uh, another Spaniard back in the 1600s said something very interesting that, um, yeah, you know, if you talk to sensible people, you may, you may get through, but you may want to just add something to the conversation just in case they don't get you, right? So we are adding data to the conversation. And we started to talk about the economic imperative of this education attainment gap particularly in the US. We're just uh, focused on the US. So you look back at that. Now look back at this. 
And the red line is routine occupations. The blue line is jobs that are non-routine. And if you look at the bands, and those bands represent economic hardship, economic crisis times. Now, look at how we are losing those routine occupations very fast, and how technology, that progress in technology, is claiming and asking for new types of jobs. Now, we have projections done by uh, the Georgetown um, Institute of uh, Education and Labor, Higher Education and Labor. And you will see that the projections we have right now are basically telling us that people need, will need in the US something beyond high school. There's no question in our mind. Now, if you're not a pie chart fan, this is another type of uh, visual. But it's the same story, right? Most of those jobs will require post-secondary education. If you look at it from an economic perspective, if we were able to reduce the attainment gaps, uh, we will be putting, adding to the economy $2.1 trillion, which is not bad. Um, we have the value of a college degree in many different forms and shapes. And there's also what we call the moral imperative. Look at the income level. If you are a wealthy kid, you will graduate from college. If you are not, it's not likely that you will. And that, is not, that has nothing to do with other than your income level. And we have enough data to say, we can predict that if you were born in the lower quintile, you're going to have a hard time graduating from college for many different circumstances. Um, I'm going to leave you with this one, and then we can just move to challenges at the end of the day. This is the distribution of people that were born in the lowest quintile. And you put them all in the map. And if you don't have any higher education in America, look at what happens to you. You stay in the lowest quintile. So uh, looking forward to the conversations. Uh, we believe that data is an important thing. And um, looking forward to talking more. Thanks.